Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this new series that I'm doing, The Forgotten American. Today, uh, we have the pleasure of inviting Ari Watchman to talk to us today. We met on X Twitter, and um, I've actually met him in person. We showed up at his house in San Antonio, Travis and I, um, and in many ways, uh, he's the one that gave me the idea about doing this series because what we found out as we traveled across the country is that the people out there, just your regular folks every day, they could articulate what was going on so much better than what we were seeing on uh, financial me social media. And so without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, this data guru and, and just regular American that I met from San Antonio, Ari Watchman. How are you doing today? Melody, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. Really, you inspired me to do this, honestly, and I'm so glad that we got to meet and I'm so grateful for you and Travis and you know sharing your platforms with me. So glad to be here. Excellent. <clears throat> yes, and I'm getting over a little, I don't even know what it was. I think it was a cold, so forgive me. Um, I'll probably have to cough a couple of times here in this interview. Um, all right, let's get started. Just tell us a little bit about your background, who you are, and how you started to get interested in real estate. Sure. So I'm in my mid 30s. I'm a dad and a husband. Um, I, you know, work in kind of corporate America, and at least my last two kind of roles have been or companies. And, you know, I, I first got interested in real estate actually in 2012 you know obviously coming out of the great financial crisis i had a boss at the time who I, looking back i appreciate so much that he said this is this is a unique time in history for real estate he said are you thinking about buying if not why not right and i really wasn't that much at the time you know i was like 24 um but at the time the you know the real estate values had gone so low that i was able to afford something you know very very inexpensive um and in fact it, it doubled in value in four years and whereas you know my neighbors had it was a little one bedroom condo in, in a midtown of a city and so my neighbors had um you know bought theirs in 2006 and so it wasn't until 10 years after they bought theirs around the time I was selling mine that, you know, their value was returning to what they paid. And so I thought, wow, this is, I mean, just imagine the difference between those two, you know, making that same decision at two different periods of time. And so, you know, since then I've, I've owned other properties. I'm, I'm an accidental landlord now because, you know, I moved to be closer to family and uh, around the time that, you know, rates were starting to, to go up. And I just thought, man, I've got a 3.25 rate. And I don't know what rates are going to be when I move. I'm moving to, you know, like I said, to be closer to family, more for personal reasons. But, uh, you know, even when you're making personal decisions, sometimes the, it's hard to ignore the, you know, the financial and number side of it. So um, I'm an accidental landlord as well. Uh, I'm, I'm renting currently in San Antonio. And, uh, you know, I think more than anything, why I started doing this is because it's, it's interesting how as much data is out there for people to consume. You still hear, and I don't know if this term is um, kind of chauvinistic or, but, you know, I would call them wives tales, you know, I don't know. I can't think of a better word for it or term for it, or maybe narrative would be a more, uh, you know, more uh, better term for it. But it's like these things that I'll hear different people say almost the same thing, same words. And then really a lot of it's not even accurate. Like I've had <laughs> realtors <laughs> right. i've had well-meaning you know men who i respect who are you know a little older kind of tell me hey the real estate market has never gone down in san antonio even in the gfc and you know <laughs> meanwhile like we have been seeing values go down pretty steadily for two years so right. um i think part of it is just you know similar to what i think i think you're doing is that you know there there are a lot of there's a lot of content out there that's usually pushed by people who are financially incentivized to be selling more quantity of homes and then those same homes at higher prices because that's how their commissions are based. And, you know, there are good realtors out there. There are people that are doing their job, just earning an honest living, but they're, you know, uh, it's, I think, helpful to have access to information that I don't have any financial incentive in this. I just started noticing some weird things were happening and I, I'm also not like forecasting anything. I'm saying, here's what's actually happening 
now that, you know, most of the people that I talk to in my life aren't, aren't really aware of. So, right. Yeah. I want to stop on that old wives tell or almost urban legends, right? One of my favorite from this cycle was <clears throat> you talk to anybody in Nashville and they say a hundred people are moving here every day. And they had some version of that for Austin as well. And then <clears throat> one of my colleagues, Kenny cat PhD from X Twitter just did a recent graph that showed at no time, even during the boom, were, were there a hundred people? And and he included every county around Nashville, not just, you know, Davidson. And I was just like, thank you for doing this. I mean, and, and I heard it so much on the road. And what was fascinating to me, like when I would show up somewhere like Round Rock, Texas, where you couldn't go a block without a new home community. I talked to the people working at the hotel or whatever, and they would say, Oh yeah, you know, hundreds of people are moving here every day. There's there's no inventory. Uh, and I would think, have you driven down the street? Do you I mean, have you even looked? Have you even take but people don't take a, a left instead of a right. They go the same way every day. And so a lot of times they're just not noticing the, these things. But one of the things I love about you and your story, um, well, uh, your skills. It, you know, something I've been talking about uh, out there is that we feel politically frustrated. We feel like our votes <laughs> don't count, but you know, what I've been saying is our, you know, the way we spend our dollars does count and, and we can make that difference. You know, when our GDP is 70% consumption, we actually have a lot of agency. Um, and I've just started talking to people about what can you do in this very frustrating time because of, you know, home prices are just ridiculous. Um, and I think, you know, part of what you're doing, your analytics background is really coming into play here where you're able to look at some of this data in a way that just your, you know, somebody that doesn't have that background would never even think to do. So tell us a little bit about, you know, that analytical background and how you've brought it to uh, the San Antonio market. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. And my goal is really to say, hey, I do have a very specialized skill set. But how can I sort of condense that into very practical things that someone without that skill set could very easily go look into, right? I may be the one uncovering it, but now I'm saying, here's how to then go for yourself and, and do that. And so, I mean, my background, I've done all kinds of things related to technology, um, automation. You know, I work in analytics. I've, I, I do have a master's degree related to, you know, technology and, you um, but I also have kind of a social sciences background. So I studied psychology and economics. And I think those are both really interesting as it relates to like, how do people make decisions that they make? Well, it turns out it's not, you know, math on a spreadsheet. A lot of times it's very emotion driven. And so even if you look at like, you know, how people are compensated or how people are measured at jobs, I've done work around that too. And it's just very interesting to see how once you Kind of change that how how the incentives at play work and, and different things and so um i mean really more than anything i i started just looking at what data was out there um there's good content out there kind of taking you know Re realtor or redfin some you know some of these sources um but i started you know looking there was another website called prop wire that has you know i, I joke that i sort of don't like this website because, you know, this is the website that people use to call my phone and ask me if I want to sell my property because it's really meant for like leads of, it gives you information on properties, who owns them, things like that with mm -hmm. public information. But I'm using it more so to say like, Hey, uncover things like, wow, you know, it turns out there's another, here's another, um, you know, urban, urban legend, I guess is uh, a better term. All, all the institutional investors are buying up all the properties. OK, well, that may have, you know, at one time they were buying some, you know, but which really it even wasn't as a huge percentage in, in the grand scheme of things. But not saying that it wasn't a problem, but it just, you know, all, all the investors are buying all the homes. Well, actually, they've pivoted to now selling them. So when I you know, when you all were visiting San Antonio, I'm looking around at data, I'm looking for big price drops and I'm saying, oh, wait a second, this is American Homes for Rent. They own, you know, I don't know, 50,000 homes in the United States and they're selling this home at a big discount. And so just that question of why is that led me down this rabbit hole to really dig into it and then find, wow, some of these are like patterns that are happening. It's not just a one-off event. And I really think, you know, going back to my background in technology, 
as you can think about chat GPT or whatever new technology is out, you know, and, and you know, I have serious um, doubts about where that is right now. I know we've talked Me about, too. but you know, you think <laughs> about it, we will get to a point where technology is able to do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of finding information. But I really think the skill, I heard this on a podcast about automation, the real skill that's needed in the future as we have that technology is the ability to just ask questions. You know, right. if you start with an interesting question, why is that? Sometimes you don't even right. you don't even know what the question is. You just say, I've observed something kind of strange. And then you say, well, I've heard that all the investors are buying up all the homes. But then why is this one trying to get rid of this home at such a okay. discount? And then it just takes you down really what I think is hopefully in the end, something that just an individual without much technological background can do, which is to say, hey, can I go on my central appraiser district website and see who owns the homes on my street? Is it like one entity bought up a quarter of the street, as is the case in some mm -hmm. of the neighborhoods here? You know, because if so, again, I sometimes I engage questions that are politically like I'll, I'll engage audiences that are politically minded, you know, candidates that say we want to ban all the investors from buying homes. And while I want to enter that conversation, I'm not necessarily recommending a policy. I think the solution is really just the individual, the citizen being more equipped to then go, you know, kind of remove some of this information asymmetry that exists and say, hey, if I'm going to make a decision, rather than passing a law against what can be done, let me just at least make that decision in the most informed way that I can. Exactly. And to, and to know that they need to do that. I mean, when you're buying a home, most of the time, like you said, it, it, is, it is so emotional. It, it's almost only emotional. You, you can... And and you can see how people just get caught up, right? They see something they like and they think it's perfect. And we have we have this positive bias often as humans that where we're like, it's all going to be great. And I know that sounds crazy, but it, we really do. It's how we survive. And, and then, but to not be, no one is thinking about, oh, are, are the rest of the homes on the street owned by institutional investors? What happens if they want to sell? And it's the same with those new builds. They, they're not, you know, those those neighborhoods that are hundreds and hundreds of homes and they've sold two or three. And, you know, not only is that a safety concern, but your property value is going to be problematic. And, and so I just think that a lot of people don't understand everything you need to know. And unfortunately, all of the data providers out there, they have, an agenda, right? Like PropWire, that's leads. <clears throat> There's other ones. Realtor, of course, they want to sell you homes. You know, it's funny though, I'm starting to get emails from Realtor that says price drops in Miami, you know, price drops here. So I think that they're realizing they're going to have to pivot if they're going to try bring traffic back to their website. Because I do think we've gotten to this point where everybody's a little bit fed up with all of this and fed up with these insane prices. And so I think that they're they're starting to make that pivot. But I think, you know, what you showed us in San Antonio, <clears throat> it was perfect. And just talk about that one listing. What happened? Why they sold the increase in property taxes, et cetera? Absolutely. Yeah. So it just started with, hey, I know Melody and Travis are coming. Can I find anything interesting? Right. I, I really had it was very open ended. I didn't really know what I was looking for. So I thought, well, let me just look at I mean, you had mentioned, hey, I know there's a lot of new construction out there, but what about price drops in existing homes? And so I'm, you know, I'm downloading some data. I'm doing, you know, just looking for uh, if I can find some some big price drops. And I stumble across one that, you know, again, it was a big price drop. It's American Homes for Rent. And so I'm like, OK, why are they trying to get rid of this home? And then, you know, I start I start kind of going further down the path. And so when you all covered it, it created this discussion. And I don't know if this is what led to it, but eventually I started looking into the Bear County records and I'm like, it looks like they're selling more than they're buying. Like, I, you know, that's that's what it appears to be. Um, that those records aren't the easiest way to necessarily get an answer because they're not transaction data, but you can just look like over time. Okay. It looks like they're, they were buying at one time. Now they're selling. And then, you know, Lance Lambert comes in and says, Hey, they've actually sold uh, 600 homes in Texas in 2023 and bought zero. So again, back to right. the urban legend, 
the, the guy you encounter on the street just thinks that, you know, BlackRock wants to own the homes. And it's like, well, BlackRock doesn't own homes. Number one, they do own part of American homes for rent, but they're actually now selling. Right. And so, mm-hmm. so it's, it's just mm-hmm. you, you find one example and then you look into what's going on with it. Well, they drop the price a lot. OK, well, I also noticed that the property taxes went up a lot. So, you know, now I learned a little bit more about the property taxes and how they work as far as, you know, here in Texas, we have pretty high property taxes because we don't have state income tax, but you get some of you get some discount on your taxes if you live in the home. But an investor doesn't get that. And then also you get caps on how much the taxes go up every year, uh, more so if you're an individual than an investor. So then not only are they paying higher taxes, they're going up more per year. And then, you know, kind of, I think also probably a lot of people didn't realize when they bought their home, the value of the taxes was based on the guy that's owned it for 15 years. And Mm -hmm. so he's had these caps in place. So his taxes are, you know, really low and then they buy it. And now the assessor's like, oh, well, we'll base your taxes more on what you paid rather than what this guy had, you know, the prior owner. So anyway, all of that adds up. You start noticing investors selling. The property taxes had gone up by a lot. And these properties, they clearly weren't able to rent for what they thought they could. So they're, they're, they're having, you know, higher, higher costs, lower revenue. And, they, you know, looking at the Bear County, you know, appraiser district, you can see, oh, wow, this investor bought 25 homes on this street in a new construction neighborhood where families bought their homes in 2022. And now they're selling some of them at a deep mm-hmm. discount. And that's what led to the first key home story, which was to realize, hey, First Key Homes bought about 400 homes from Lennar, um, you know, new construction homes uh, from around 2022 period, and they would buy them in these big chunks. And what happened is, you know, essentially now in each of those neighborhoods where they once bought these large chunks, they're selling a few at, at fairly large discounts. And so, mm-hmm. you know, the the the, th- the implication there is that it, it could, I'm only speculating. I'm working with the data that I have. Right. But, you know, what I can tell is they either one, they need the cash and, you know, or two, they may be even trying to manipulate the appraisal values because they realize, wow, I'm paying a lot of taxes on these 25 right. homes that I own on the same street. If I just sell one of them for, you know, a discount, well, then maybe that'll lower the taxes on the rest. Or maybe if I sell one at a discount, I can turn that into a write-off and pay, you know, there's, Mm -hmm. there's some reason why they're doing it this way. And it could just be, Hey, you know, they're trying to sell and they're realizing that nobody wants this particular home. I mean, that could be the answer as well, but you know, really all of it points to, you know, If I know that going into that situation, I buy a home on a street, I know 25 of them are owned by this corporate landlord. Okay, I I assume that risk. But most people probably don't know that. And when I talk to people in the neighborhoods, they're like, I had no idea. I noticed there was a for rent sign in the yard and it was there for quite a long time. But (laughs) I I didn't, you know, so so it's it is just trying to tell people, hey, if you're going to if you're going to buy a home, especially a new construction home it would make sense to go on one of these appraiser websites or even like the, um, I mean, I think the appraiser website is a good place to start and just have an idea of like how many big investors own homes on the street. Or I think you alluded to this, how many are they going to build and have they built? Like Mm -hmm. if you buy a house and the market is really slowing down, you buy a house and there's like, you know, you're only, there, there are only a few of them that have sold and you buy one. And now the builders left with what's another issue here is they, build all these spec homes, you know, speculatively, and they may get left with them cutting the prices. So you don't want to be the person Mm -hmm. that either, hey, the investor bought and now they're cutting the price or I bought and there was way too many left. The builder bought. Now they're cutting the price because either one of those situations leads to you saying, well, I bought this because I wanted to build equity and I wanted to, you know, it's it's my home. You know, unfortunately, a lot a large percentage of people's wealth ends up being their home. And so if if some investor that's got 25 of them and they're just some you know number on a spreadsheet for them and they're selling at a big loss or the builders got to move them cuz you know the builder can't decide oh, I'll just hold on to it and live here you know they can't no. do that they have to sell it right. they, I mean you know so right. there's just all these situations where that information asymmetry lends itself to you really 
needing to kind of do your research as a citizen and know what you're getting into. And unfortunately, look, some realtor may know that or, you know, want to tell you that, but I would venture to guess that whoever sold people a home in the neighborhood with the investor or the ton of, you know, un, unsold uh, spec homes, they're probably not going to warn them and say, oh, hey, you might want to look out for this. Mm -hmm. and oftentimes, not to say there aren't good realtors out there, but, right. you know, their their incentives are aligned to making the sale. And that's what's so interesting about real estate. It's like they're supposed to be representing you. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I, it's just it's hard to put anyone in a position where they have to choose between I want to sell this home and get the paycheck or I right. want to like really dig into the weeds and say, right. hey, I don't know, this is kind of a little risky with this particular right. home. <clears throat> right. And and we know there was a huge proliferation of realtors. At one point, there were more realtors than homes for sale. You know, as that COVID boom started, I mean, people just went bananas and everybody became a realtor. And like you say, you know, in times like that, there's a lot of enthusiasm and it's you know, contagious. And, and I think that, you know, when a man's paycheck depends on it, they're not going to realize, or they're not really, you know, on purpose, they're not going to really realize what's happening, what's changing. And I think a lot of the realtors that aren't data driven, you know, I, I, I know some good ones as well, but they're, they're, they get into the weeds. They look at the data, <clears throat> they really dig in. But if they're not data driven, they they are just it's just narrative. That's all. It's just a sales pitch. That's it. And and the whole home prices never go down. Several times in our history, <laughs> that has happened. You know, and oh, date the rate. Okay, well, how is that working out for a lot of people? You know, even and and you know, this makes me crazy. None of them actually understand mortgage rates. That's you know, if the Fed cuts. And the bond market decides they don't, you know, they don't like where that 10 year is. That's your mortgage rate right there. You know, you follow the 10 year um, because most mortgages pay off within seven years. And so, you know, the reason we got such low rates was because the Fed was buying that mortgage box securities, the MBS. And that's really what closed that spread. And so, you know, the Fed cutting rates may not impact mortgage the way people think it's going to. And so, but most realtors don't even understand that. And, you know, actually, I've met people with an economics degree that don't understand that. And so, you know, this is really complicated stuff. And I and I, I love it. Right. Like you're trying to give our forgotten American the tools they need to be able to go out and make an informed choice. And I mean, honestly, if, most people have they're not thinking like this at all. They're looking, is it close to the school that I want to go to? <laughs> um, and, you know, they're looking at, you know, just various things like that. And, and they're not thinking about the future. And like you said, in this country, we're trained to look at, you know, our wealth in our home as wealth, you know, that's the wealth effect. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of people are, are, are getting surprised right now as they list their homes because they've really been looking at a fake number. And we know Fannie Mae came out and said, you know, uh, they looked at 7 million comparables and 55% of them had inflated values. And so for appraisals. So I, you know, I think there is a big, a big, big shock coming um, for folks. But I love the fact that you've, you've dug in. And now let's talk a little bit about, you know, so first key, uh, Cerberus, my old boss, um, you know, they, they didn't learn their lessons during the GFC because they basically got a get out of jail free card uh, from the government when we got TARP funds <laughs> and they were able to divest their majority stake. Um, but so they're just in it again. But a lot of times they're called the smart money. I would probably uh, say that's questionable having worked with them. Um, but they are not going to carry these costs when they're not making. I mean, if this is not, you know, profitable and, and with those increased property taxes and increases in insurance, uh, they're they're going to have to get rid of them because it doesn't make any sense. I, the only thing that makes sense is buy low, right? I mean, right. And, and now it's not low anymore. The cost to carry that is far too great. So they will become sellers. 
Um, and but I wanted to talk for a second about the policy angle that you were talking about because I too just wish like politicians, we don't need a policy that says <laughs> institutional investors can't buy. If we stop bailing everyone out, if we stop, if we just let you know price corrections happen, if we let the free market go, we won't need a policy like that because of just what I was saying. Investors will not, they aren't going to make any money at this game right now. And they're going to have to get out of the game. <clears throat> so, but no, what do you I, think I, about that? Yeah. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. I mean, we, people respond to incentives. You know, you, you hear sometimes people think, oh, it's a grand conspiracy for you to own nothing and be happy. And okay. Maybe someone somewhere, I, I don't know. But all I know is at the end of the day, most companies or whoever, wealth managers, their job is to make money, right? <laughs> right? They don't have this grand social plan in place more, you know, more than likely. They're deciding, is this profitable or is this not profitable? And unfortunately, they were in a situation for years. And I think this is, I mean, the societal effect on this, I could sidebar on, I'll, I'll spare you. But, you know, we just had a long period of time where it basically made no sense to just save money because right. interest rates were so low. Like my most of my adult life, I couldn't really make much just putting money in a savings account or, you know, a CD. And so we just had this environment where for so long there were no real safe returns. You couldn't just put your money in some, you know, you're managing a large amount of money and there aren't safe returns. Well, real estate does tend to go up over time and you know it cash flows when when you have a crash like 2008 and i mean that was the time that they were really probably interested in buying is you know when the values were really low but you know that we it's such a different environment right now compared to that that i don't think people adjust and i think that's what happens to individuals too they say my friend down the road was making a ton of money by buying a house four years ago and then he just sold it and bought a bigger one and it's like right. or whatever you know I mean, he probably didn't do that because of the the way the rates are right. but you know <laughs> it just right. isn't it just an example like they they see that someone was making a lot of money three or four years ago and then that's when unfortunately some of the misinformed or the you know less savvy money gets in is towards the end because they're like well that guy made a lot of money doing that so maybe maybe i just need to be buying real estate and you know you add that to like the i get all these youtube ads for why don't you own an apartment building well i'll tell you because i i don't have a reason to <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, but I do think these these large wealth managers were like, hey, there's no safe returns. You know, we we can get I don't know what percentage cap rate, but, at, you know, at one point, I'm sure you could get a decent return on real estate. It wasn't like huge or probably even expected to be what it was from the way that the home value is inflated. But, you know, it was just pretty stable return. Now it's like, if I can put my money in the bank and get 5% on a short-term treasury, like, why am I doing all this with, you know, renting homes and, you know, even the risk of just, right. you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of effort and cost and, you know, changing environment, insurance, man, Texas, Florida, places that are on the coast. I mean, we're, we're seeing insurance crisis, you know, crisis right. happening and, I just think it is it's the environment has changed, but people's ideas and narratives haven't yet adjusted. Right. And that's why I sort of intend to try to break some of this stuff down into like, you know, something that's explainable to your average person. My wife, really smart, has a master's degree, but totally unrelated to, you know, finance, corporate America, even technology. Right. So I like as a, as a nice bounce, bounce off of somebody to try to explain what I'm seeing in a right. way that makes sense to just your average person who isn't really get down in the weeds in this stuff. And so that's why the, right. the tweet the other day I thought was an interesting one, which is, you know, when you put it in kind of simple numbers, someone can understand it was the pending ratio. It was like, hey, 2017 to 2019 for every, you know, 10 homes for sale, six were going under contract. OK, that's normal. It was this, it was consistent for I wish the data went back further. But that pre, you know, pre 2020, those three years. Well, then it went to for every 10 homes for sale, there's 22 buyers. OK, so you can imagine there's people fighting over it, bidding over, asking, they're waving inspections, they're doing all these things. OK, well, now in San Antonio, we're at like 3.8 pendings for every, you know, 
10 active listings. So we've gone from, you know, kind of normal market to super supply constrained market to like getting to where there's probably more supply than we even need. And I just don't think, again, people are, they're not like refreshing data and looking at it. And not to say that they necessarily need to do that. They just probably need a voice other than someone trying to sell them a home that says, right. hey, values never mm -hmm. go down. I mean, I had this conversation with a realtor who I, I kind of forgotten that Zillow's model is if you want any information, it links you to a buyer's agent. Because I was looking into right. doing a couple of kind of savvier um, type investment type things. And I just wanted some information. And um I, I get connected with a buyer's agent and I felt bad because he got me the information. I'm like, I don't want to make this guy, you know, answer an email for me and I'm not really probably going to work with him. So I just asked him, what do you think of the market? You know, mm -hmm. and then I didn't feel bad anymore about uh, choosing <laughs> not to do anything with him in the future because he said, oh, you know, and, and I do think San Antonio in particular was wasn't one of the places that got hit really bad during the last crash. That is that's true. But he was like, you know, prices are always, always they've never gone down in San Antonio. And I'm like, so I sent him the little graph from Redfin that's like, yeah, we've been consistently <laughs> on a downtrend for like two years here. And so his his answer, it floored me. He said he said something like, well, I'm not so concerned with the values in terms of like the sale prices as much as the market appraised values. And so I'm thinking, OK, well, like appraisals are based on sales. And what is wow. the market? Like, do you, do you right. mean, you know, so so wow. I just told him, I said, either that answer tells me that you're either not very informed or that you're, you know, purposely kind of being misleading, in which case I have, you know, I'm not interested in, right. in buying a home. But I would, you know, if if and when I get to the point that I'm I'm ready to buy something else, I'm going to ask people. Did you recommend anybody waive their inspection in 2022? You know, right. how, how many people did you say to go over asking? What do you think right. of the market? I'm not asking right. for someone to say, oh, yeah, like Zillow projects that your market's going down 3% this year, which is the case for San Antonio. Like I get right. they're not going to go that transparent, but if they're telling me never been a better time to buy and, right. you know, yeah. uh, I'm just, okay, no thanks. No thanks. Yeah, I so I want to talk a little bit about that analysis. I I mean, which I loved, and I was just so jealous. I, I think because well, you know, just like not really, but you know what I mean. I was like, man, why did I think of that? Because I, you know, I have this new theory that I've been talking about that I believe that you know part of this inventory myth that we've been hearing really was less about the fact that we had less inventory and more that it wasn't going to the listing sites. It was being done on social media, things like that. And so you can't look at an historical graph from realtor.com or, or even NAR for their without, you know, what, what else happened during that time period? Well, social media happened and, and, you know, we heard all kinds of stories about people selling homes in two hours on Facebook, never making it to a listing site. And, you know, I dove into, all of that. Um, but what you did by that little, just different view of everything, it's like, okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we have a lot of inventory or a little inventory. We have no appetite right now. We have no movement, you know? And we do, of course, have inventory mismatches where none of them are priced affordably, as we know. <laughs> you know, we're starting to see cracks like, you know, in Texas and Florida. And honestly, Denver. I mean, it's starting to happen all over the country, but that analysis was, you know, why I love talking to you, why I love those, because it was just so, I was like, of course, like, why didn't I think of that? You know, that's such a good way to look at, but you know, you're a data technology person. I, and, and so you're going to have that idea. And, you know, I've had different ideas that are similar and that's what we can share with people. And I, I call it triangle triangulation all the time, you you know, just looking at things, just a little bit different view than that mainstream narrative, <clears throat> because we all know it, it was being pushed by, I mean, you know, I think if people don't know that the wall street journal shares an owner with realtor.com, <laughs> they really should think about that. And, you know, yeah. the people that own the stock market, the stock exchange, New York stock exchange also own origination software and, and servicing software. 
I mean, there is just so much vested interest. Um, and, you know, they're not looking out for our forgotten American. They're not looking out for the regular everyday person who just needs to buy a home, you know. But like you said, we kind of went into this crazy mania. I don't know if you saw that article about the guy who had the buses uh, that he was taking people to look at apartment buildings. Um, I posted it on X Twitter, I think, yesterday. And it's just this picture of him. He's got a T-shirt on. It says, Rents Due. And there's like three buses in the background. And, and what they did was just take people to apartment buildings, <laughs> like older apartment buildings. And and now you're seeing all of them. I mean, they're going to special servicing, going to special servicing. I mean, the biggest apartment uh, owner in San Francisco just, I mean, 1.8, I think, was it 1.8 billion, uh, you know, loan? And it was worth 1.5 billion. I mean, we're already starting to see these upside down situations and, and you know, it's just getting started. <clears throat> so, you know, tell me a little bit about, and you don't have to forecast, but what you think uh, might be, ha I'm very curious about that neighborhood we went to actually, because it seemed like it was getting sucked dry um, as I think people might be moving out to those new home communities. But what do you really see happening um, in San Antonio? And again, you don't have to forecast just what you're you're kind of seeing on the ground right now. Yeah. And so the best way I can explain it would be the inventory is as high as it's ever been in the data series. Right. So, again, going back to the narratives, well, we're low inventory. OK, maybe in the U.S. or maybe in especially like the Northeast, but San Antonio, the whole low inventory thing, th that's done like that happened. It went whew, during, you know, 2020, 2021, now it's higher than it was before. So we have the highest inventory we've had in the data series. We all going back to like 2012. We also have the, so the most recent full month data that I saw was May. Um, so we have the, uh, we have the lowest May sales going back to 2016, except for 2020, which for obvious reasons was slow, but it's even like comparable to 2020. You think about everything that was going on then. So we have the highest inventory, the lowest amount of sales. So we also, you know, you can imagine then the next step is we have the number of price reductions is way up. Um, and we also have just like I mentioned, a ton of building. And now you're seeing them get more and more aggressive. Like before it was, hey, we'll give you a better interest rate or maybe some appliances or whatever from the builders. Now they're like, we'll take 50 K off this, you know, right. $450,000 house. And, right. and they're still doing the buy downs and they're still. Do so, and, right. you know, to your point, those buy downs probably not always captured in some of the comps and things like that. So, yeah, I, I mean, we're seeing there's just a ton of building that area you're mentioning is the West side. And so the West side of San Antonio is where a lot of the building is both in terms of, overall number and then also as a percentage of like what was the inventory there five years ago right so they did a ton of building and it's particularly on the far west and the far east the far west uh, is a little higher in the far east has a lot of very inexpensive homes but that area there's not a lot out there and you know that's what i think you probably laughed at or joked about the picture of me with all the builder signs and then a couple of political signs you know like sprinkled <laughs> yeah. in because it's like they had all these builders build all these homes and then you know that that's where some of the investors are selling but it's also like there's nothing out there i was looking for a place to right. plug in my laptop a coffee shop they had a truck stop mcdonald's that's all they had or right. uh, you know right. there's there's not really much out there and so you know, you've got these, I think what kind of happened, if I'm just speculating is you had, you know, a lot of these, like both the investors and the builders are kind of these national companies. And they're like, hey, the land's pretty cheap here. We could probably build a right. ton of homes here. Let's go there. Right. And they probably don't know, like, hey, most people aren't trying to move to this particular area who live in San Antonio. Right. The people who got right. caught by that are we did have a lot of uh, migration. So some of the people I've talked to in some of these neighborhoods are like, oh, I heard San Antonio is booming. We wanted to move here. It was a little less strict here in 2020. You know, some of it's political stuff, but also the cost of living slow. So we just thought this would be, you know, a great area to move in. But meanwhile, the locals are like, well, we're not, you know, the, the, they're not buying up all these houses. So you do have people who don't know much about the city buying some of them. If some people, you know, probably taking advantage of some of the offers from the builders, um, but you just have it's very concentrated. So where the investors are and where the building is, it's very concentrated. 
But you compare that to like, you know, a lot of the city is, you know, far above past, you know, kind of pre 2020 inventory. But the north side of the city, which tends to be kind of a higher end area and, you know, better you know, kind of known for the best schools and et cetera, they're actually still below um, the, you know, the, the pre 2020 inventory. So that's where being really, you know, granular matters, knowing within yes. a city. Um, but overall, I would just say, you know, I'm I'm definitely on the sidelines. I'm qualified to buy a home, but I'm like, look, I there's no reason for me to rush into it. I want to see what happens this fall. There's so many other things happening. And I feel like we're just at the cusp of seeing the price cuts, seeing true price discovery. And I, you know, I want to make a 30 year decision on a mortgage like once to see what happens with that rather than, you know, kind of right. jump into it now. And so, you know, I think a lot of these homes are sitting. Um, it's it's getting to the point where you could start negotiating if you really had something you yeah. were interested in. But again, I'm 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 in no no hurry whatsoever. No rush. Right. Yeah. And uh, did you see that Lennar uh where they in their last quarterly or earnings did the average buy downs, you know, and incentives? I mean, it was insane. Like I think it was the Texas average 80,000 or is that Florida? I can't remember, but I mean, they are doing, and, and they have to move this product. You mentioned it, you mentioned it earlier in the show. They, they aren't like a, a regular homeowner who can say, well, uh, you know, maybe I don't want to move or, or maybe I want to do something else. They have to move that product. And, and, you know, they, we've heard like through the Zellman survey that the traffic has increased a little bit. And I think, you know, the builders know they're competing with those existing homes. And, and, and the, as that inventory inventory starts to rise, they're, they're getting super aggressive and it, they're going to get more and more aggressive. I mean, the, typically over the past 25 years, builder home prices peak in May. And so they have likely peaked, you know, we saw that month over month decline. I have a feeling this month is going to be uh, very interesting. <laughs> And we're going to see another decline. Um, and I think what, what will be fascinating is whether the existing homes, we see one more uptick there. You know, we broke the all time high for medium price, the, at least for what NAR tracks last month, which was just absolute insanity. But you could see underneath that it's all those it's more expensive homes being sold. But before I let you go, I just quickly want to talk about, you know, uh, your accidental landlord situation. So, sure. you know, tell me, I think everybody decided they wanted to be a landlord. This is very similar to what happened right before the Great Depression. Uh, tell me about being a landlord. I mean, you know, is it is it uh, is it low? Is it passive income? I guess is my question. Oh, it's definitely not passive, but I mean, don't get me started here. I know we only have a few minutes and I need to drop it. Yeah. So the interesting thing about it is, yeah, I mainly decided I could keep this home over here at a 3.25% interest or buy one over here at seven. And it's like, okay, well that's, and then, you know, a lot of the math behind it really is like, okay, well I can write off repairs if on this one and then rent this one. And, you know, so th there's a lot of advantages to it. And if you look at like the sheer numbers of it, it really, it really does work out. It's not without effort, but you know what I found? I think, you know, what we talked about, you think about realtors, what's happening with them is think about how much both technological and societal change has happened, you know, over even just the last few years. And one of them that I've realized with um, that was both frustrating about being an accidental landlord. And then also um, I've actually found a, a solution for is I had a property manager who I realized was doing a really bad job. And, right. and so what I realized was, they were taking a long time to get this place rented. You know, they're taking a long time to do the repairs. And I'm like, I know someone who has a maintenance. I know a ton of people in this city. I used to live there. This was my my house. So I have a lot of people that I know could I could turn to self-managing. And what I realized is that the main thing that this property manager was doing wrong is they were like, we had this many tours and then no one signed a lease. And so eventually I ask and I, I decide I'm probably going to fire them. And so I tell my friend, hey, will you go over there and take some pictures for me just in case I want to sell it or I want to, you know, whatever. And so come to find out there was a problem in the house and all the property managers tours were self tours. So oh, wow. what happened is during, you know, 
the pandemic, they got used to this low touch, like mm -hmm. self touring technology right. was right. implemented and then society was changing. And so they went from, it used to be this very, like a lot of manual effort for them to, I think they got comfortable just like the realtors got right. comfortable selling homes in a hot market. And they got just happy to just let somebody go look at it. And meanwhile, I'm like, I know something is wrong because enough right. people have seen it. And it's, it's like really ideal. I mean, we bought it for ourselves. It's, it's a good, you know, decent school district, but also not very expensive. It's got a big yard. Right. It's near a nice park for the kids. It's on a you know private street. So you don't, don't have through traffic. So I'm like, I know something's up. Anyway, my friend found a problem. And so um, of course I realized I could switch to, I, I had my maintenance person that owns a the company there just install like cameras and smart locks on my phone. So I can do the same thing the property manager was doing myself. And so they were taking all this time. I found a super qualified, you know, great family to rent the house in a week. And I'm not wow. paying the property manager anymore. And it's, you know, I'm doing it from my phone in another state. And, and you know, I do yeah. have, like I said, I have people on the ground who can help me when, if and when I need it, um, which not everyone's in that situation. But yeah, I mean, I, and I do plan to do a, a, probably some content around like, why did I switch to self-managing my property? Right. You know, what what is the math behind why I'm a renter and a landlord at the same time? And uh, yeah, so. And, yeah, yeah, and you're not the only one, right? So any, any last words that you want to share? And of course, please tell everyone where they can find you, Ari Watchman. Sure. Um, yeah. So Ari Watchman is my is my handle on X. That's where I post a lot. And then YouTube. I do have a YouTube page. A lot of stuff about what's going on here, but also kind of how to inform yourself, which would apply to other places. Um, very data driven. And, you know, I'll, I'll tease real quickly. We, we talked a little bit about, look, I don't think government solutions are, you know, the answer. But at the same time, we've had a lot of government solutions already pushed. And I think as citizens, we need to look into that. So one of the things I'm really looking into is the effect of PPP money on the housing market. And, you know, I know uh, at some point I'll, I'll definitely be back to share that wait. with you or DNN yes. or, you know, we'll, we'll yes. talk about that in particular. But that's the main thing. So, so follow me on there again. Super grateful for you for the platform. I think the last thing I would say is that and I'm trying to sprinkle a little bit more of this in, but, you know, I think so much of this is not just like numbers and metrics, although I love that stuff. So much of it is almost like psychological and then mm -hmm. even spiritual, you know, yes. as far as my own personal views and things. I just think our society is pushing a message that's so different than people, you know, I mean, I guess people have never changed. It's always, there's always been that tendency towards greed, wealth, materialism. But, you know, in the Bible, as an example, Jesus talked a lot more about greed, wealth, materialism than he even did about heaven and hell. So it's a right. it's a topic where I think it's so deep. And I do think as we make these big decisions, we need to think about it. The data, psychologically, what's happening in markets. Also, just what does this mean for for my family and I and my goals in life and just who I am? You know, that's one thing I think Travis talks about sometimes, but I've had the same experience. You know, people try to make me feel guilty about not wanting to buy a house, even though I can, because I'm a dad. And what kind of right. experience are you giving your children? And I'm like, you know what? I'm really enjoying being a dad. And I think we have a great life. And, you know, we don't need yeah. physical things or purchases in order to kind of validate that. So that's my little soapbox for the day. I do have to run. I really appreciate you, Melody. Again, you're you're my inspiration for this. So Thank you so much for having me on and sharing your platform. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for joining. And I'll put all of your links down in the show notes so people can find you. And I really appreciate it. And like I said, you were part of the inspiration for this as well. So thanks again and have a great day. Thank you.